Hello, yogis, and welcome back to Flow with Lo. I'm Lo, and right now we're not gonna flow, but I do have something really, really exciting to talk with you about. So you guys know every week I do two videos. We release them every Wednesday for Well Woman Wednesday. And this week you have your yoga class, and then you also are gonna get a little class on a holiday. It's actually today. I'm recording this on Monday, August 1st, but it's not gonna release until Wednesday, August 3rd. Um, but the, what we're going to talk about today, you can really celebrate it anytime this week within, I would suggest doing it within the first week of August, just to really tap into the potency of the holiday and of the season. Um, but today we're talking all about Lunasa and Lunasa is one of my most favorite holidays of the year. Um, I, I'm going to actually be reading from this book for you guys, just so I don't miss anything. Um, and I, I keep to the accuracy of the content because I really want to, to share this as accurately and as completely as possible. So I'm going to be reading to you from this book today, but Lunasa is, um, one of the Sabbaths on the wheel of the year. It's a traditional pagan holiday and, um, it's, it's really exciting. It's the officially unofficial start to fall, at least in my world. Um, this is when I really allow myself to let loose. Hence the reason why I'm dressed the way I'm dressed today. I have... <laughs> Like this is manifestation at its finest. I am beckoning in some cooler weather because it's really fucking hot here in South Carolina. Um, <clears throat> but Lunasa, August 1st, celebrated in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, it's celebrated on February 1st in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, but it's the first of the three harvest festivals. The next one is Mavon, which is actually gonna fall on um, the autumn equinox. And then the last one is Samhain, which is Halloween. So there are three harvest festivals. This is the harvest season. It is my absolute favorite time of year, Christmas and Yule are really cool. My birthday is immediately after Christmas on December 29th, but the harvest season, fall, autumn, there's just something special about it. And my soul is literally one giant autumn color palette. So <laughs> I'm just, I'm so excited. So I'm really excited to dive into today's topic. Um, and just share with you about this. This is something that I feel really called to share, something that I feel really called to embody in my own life. I've dabbled over the last year or so with celebrating the Sabbath and following the wheel of the year, um, but it hasn't been as intentional as I wanted it to be. So I'm really utilizing Lunasa as like my starting point um, to really begin honoring these seasonal changes and transitions. Um, it's just, it, it's one of those things where it just feels right. It just feels like coming home. It feels very in alignment with um, <clears throat> my belief and my teachings on cyclical living and honoring our bodies. This is just an extension and a bigger representation of honoring that same cyclical ebb and flow just in terms of, of nature and the natural world. And um, so I'm gonna be actually sharing these little videos every time we, we cross over a Sabbath. So you can expect another one come Mavon and then Salon and so on and so forth moving forward. So if this is something that you're interested in, you haven't already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and make sure you do that because I'm going to be going over the entire wheel of the year all year long, starting today with Luna Lunasa. So I'm really excited. Okay. Um, I am also sipping from a new mug, new mug who dis, and I'm sipping a coconut chai, which is my new favorite drink. If you guys want the recipe, please let me know in the comments. I will be happy to share it with you. It's really simple and it's so freaking delicious. Mm. So good. So good. Okay. Let's talk about Lunasa. Okay. <clears throat> so I am pulling from it's a really, really uh, informative text. It's called The Witch's Wheel of the Year by Andrew Kierman. Kiernan, excuse me, rituals, spells, and practices for magical Sabbaths, holidays, and celebrations. And it goes through the entire wheel of the year. And um, it's just, it's really, really informative. So I'm excited to share it with you guys. Okay. So like I said, it's, this is Lunasa. It's also known as Lamas. Um, it's celebrated in the Northern Hemisphere on August 1st, February 1st in the Southern Hemisphere. And it has several other names, but typically in our area, you would hear it either called Lamas or Lunasa. At Lunasa, the darker half of the year is already underway. Wheat, tall and golden, sways in the fields under the falling light, ready for the first harvest to begin. The harvest of grain and first fruits begins not long after summer haying, when bound bales dock the rolling farmlands and seed pods hang heavy from the dry sheaves. 
apples, peaches, blueberries, grapes, and other fruits begin to ripen as the fields and gardens buzz with late summer pollinators foraging for nectar-rich plants. The flowers have long since dropped their seeds with only a few sunny wildflowers remaining in the drying brush. Though the land is glowing, the light is dwindling and the threshold to autumn is at our feet. This turn of the wheel brings the difficult work of reaping all that we have sown. Harvest season sustains us, but at a price. The seed we have nurtured from intention to nourishment, we must now cut down in the field. A noble death that gives us life. But it raises the question, did we plant enough to sustain us through the barren months ahead? There's also a page on correspondences. Correspondences being things that are associated with Lunasa and this, this particular part of the harvest season. So if you're someone who has an altar, or if you'd like to start an altar, this is a really great time because a lot of the symbols and the colors and things like that, it's, it's seasonal, right? It's associated with fall, with autumn, with, with Halloween, and everything that is kind of this fall time is very traditional of Lunasa. So it's really easy to decorate. If you're someone who's wanting to kind of begin dabbling in um, celebrating and honoring the Sabbaths and things like that, but you don't really want to be super overt with it, or you're still in quote unquote the broom closet, and you want to celebrate without being like very out and overt with it, um, then it's really easy to do it this time of year. This is um, a great time of year to, to begin kind of stepping forth a little bit more boldly in your witchy woo woo spiritualness, um, if you'd like to, because it, everyone's doing it <laughs> and no one's going to know the intention behind your actions unless you share them. So some common correspondences with Lunasa are altar decorations, including agricultural and smithcraft tools, cauldrons or chalices, corn dollies, spears, sunflowers, and wheat sheaves. Animals associated with Lunasa are the calf, centaur, griffin, horse, phoenix, rooster, sheep, and stag. Common celebrations for honoring Lunasa are bread making, bonfires, canning, feasting, and grain harvesting. Colors include burnt orange, yellow ochre, olive green, golden brown. Deities, if you'd like to work with them, include Beowa of the Anglo-Saxon, Lu and Ta Tao Tiu, I can never pronounce her name properly, of the Celt Celtic tradition, Osiris of the Egyptian tradition, Hermes and Mercury of Greco-Roman, and John Barleycorn of Neo-Pagan. The direction associated with Lunasa is south and west. The elements are fire and water. Common food and drinks for celebrating are ale, barley cakes, bilberries, cider, coal cannon, crab apples, garlic, grains and bread, grapes, jam, nuts, onions, potatoes, squash, wild berries, and wine. Herbs, incense, and oils include barley, basil, blackthorn, calendula, chamomile, coneflower, corn, dragon's blood, elder, frankincense, goldenrod, hops, meadowsweet, oats, poppy, rose hips, rosemary, sage, safflower, sandalwood, sunflowers, and wheat. Musical instruments include bells, cymbals, drums, gongs, guitars, harps, lyres, sistrums, and violins. Stones or crystals are carnelian, citrine, peridot, orange calcite, red jasper, tiger's eye, and yellow topaz. Symbols include corn dollies, plows, sickles, slingshots, spears, sun, and wheat. Themes are bounty, creativity, death, harvest, preparation, reaping, strength, and transformation. Trees, apple, ash, elder, hazel, oak, and rowan. And the zodiac and planet placement are Leo and the sun. Sun is at 15 degrees Leo. You guys, what is happening? <laughs> what are we doing here? So those are just some really common ways that you can begin to really incorporate and honor this turn of the wheel in your own life if you'd like to. Start an altar, you know, my quote, my dog's like being inappropriate over there. Um, my biggest suggestion for if you're building your first altar is to include things that represent all four elements. So earth, wind, water, and fire. And I mean, the earth element, you can have a plant or you can have crystals, the water, you can have um, like a mist or a spray, or you can have like, just like a little bowl of water if you'd like. Um, if you have a living plant, then you watering the plant in my mind also counts as the water element. Um, fire element would be a candle. Um, and then the air element can be actually lighting the candle and the wick and the flame. Um, 
Also bells represent wind, feathers, things like that. So I typically recommend using, um, incorporating things that represent each of the four elements and then bring in some of these pieces and, and just create yourself this, this fun little, little space. I have little altars all over. I have a big altar in my room and then I have a kitchen altar and just little altars sprinkled throughout our house that no one's going to look at it and know it's an altar. It really just looks like right now it looks like fall decor. <laughs> so bringing these things in, incorporating them into your life as a way to honor the shifts and the changes that are happening externally in the natural world around us, but that also reflect internally, especially for wound carrying women, the luteal phase of our cycle is a representation of our internal autumn, right? So right now we would really be transitioning out of ovulation and into the luteal phase. That's the, the cycle that mother nature is going in right now, at least in the Northern hemisphere, she's kind of closing out ovulation and being really, really fertile and moving closer into the luteal phase where she's going to begin to reap what she's sown, harvest it in preparation for her internal winter or menstruation. So it's just a beautiful representation of the cycle that we go through every single month. Okay, let's talk about astrologic, the astrological basis. Um, this is the third cross quarter day on the wheel of the year and signals the midway point between the summer solstice and the autumn equinox. In the zodiac, the sun reaches the 15 degree mark in the fixed sign of Leo, the lion, who is ruled by none other than the fiery energy of the sun. But as the, as the gateway to autumn, Lunasa represents an elemental shift, a cooling of the embers in the water just around the bend. In the night sky, the dipper drops down, the big dipper, excuse me, drops down to scoop up the incoming element of water. The seasonal full moons of Lunasa are the sturgeon moon of August and the corn moon of September. And the warm waters of the late summer are teeming with fish and the fields are swaying with golden grain. This is the time to reap what you have sown. If you would like to um, celebrate the sturgeon moon in August with me, I'm actually hosting a full moon circle. It is August 11th, I believe. It's on my yoga calendar, my, Aug my August yoga calendar. Um, I believe it's August 11th. It's the second Thursday of the month. Um, but I'm hosting a virtual full moon gathering um, where we'll do yoga and meditation and really just honor that night's full moon, do some intention settings and things like that. I'll drop the link to that in my bio, or excuse me, not in the bio, but in the, in the description of this video if you'd like to join me. Um, normally it's $10, but your first class, which this would be considered a, a yoga class, your first yoga class with me is always free. I'll drop that code in the description too. Um, but I'd love to have you. And we're just gonna honor the sturgeon moon together. Okay, let's keep going. Um, the next couple of pages, they give a few different um, ritual practices that you can do. I'm not gonna go over those. You can check out the book yourself if you'd like to go over all of those. But for the sake of, of time, um, I just wanna keep to um, kind of the historical relevance of, um, of the holiday. So let's talk about pagan cultures and deities. At Lunasa, the goddess has given birth to the harvest and both she and the god must die to nourish the human race. The first harvest of grain is ubiquitous celebration across the world. Corn, wheat, barley, and other grains have been dietary staples since the forests were cleared for agricultural, agriculture thousands of years ago. Ancient pagans worshiped agricultural gods in hopes that the harvest would be abundant and protected from disease and pests. Germanic peoples, in Norse, in Norse mythology, the harvest festivals were an opportunity to express gratitude to Freyr, the god of virility, favorable weather, and abundant harvest with the sacrificial slaying of his beloved boar. Although Thor, the god presiding over weather, was likely venerated to some degree during the harvest, his wife, the goddess Sif, played a larger part in the personification of the grain that was being cut down sheaf by sheaf. Just as the wheat turned golden in the fields, Loki, the trickster, cut off sheep's long flaxen locks as a terrible prank. Enraged, Thor demanded that Loki replace her hair, and Loki set off to the land of the dwarves, who promised her hair spun from real gold that would magically grow on Sif's head. Modern heathens celebrate Freyist at this time to honor the Scandinavian origins of the, of the grain harvest. The Anglo-Saxons celebrated the first grain harvest with the pagan holiday of Hathmas, also known as Lothmas. The barley god, Beowa, likely inspired the character of John Barleycorn, whose infamous 16th century English folk song recounts the tale of a man who personifies the life cycle of the barley crop and the beer made from it. Each year during the grain harvest, John Barleycorn must give his life for the nourishment of the human race. In some traditions, the god's spirit is preserved in a loaf of bread made from the last sheaf which is then shared between villagers at a community feast. 
From the last sheaf, a corn dolly to house the spirit of the grain mother is made and kept on the hearth until it is plowed into the field along with the seed to fertilize the spirit of God. Upon Christianization of Anglo-Saxons, the festival was renamed Lamas, and the first bread was brought to the church to be consecrated and shared or split into four equal parts and placed in the corners of the barn to protect the harvest. The Celts. The festival of Lunasa celebrates the Celtic sun god Lu. A fiercely talented warrior, Lu was born in captivity to Cain of the Tuatha de Danann and Ethne of the Fomorians. Saved by Tau Tiua, a mortal, a mortal and queen of the Firbolg, Lu grew up to be known as the many talented god whose skills earned him passage once again into the High King's Court on the hill of Tara. Through a series of battles and the final slaying of his grandfather and former captor, Baylor of the Evil Eye, Lu defeated the Fomorians, the mythical monsters of drought, famine, and darkness. Tau Tiu, who set forth to clear the to clear the bloody war-ridden fields of Ireland for agriculture, died thereafter of exhaustion. As an homage to his foster mother, Lou held a festival for her each year during the first harvest in what is known as Lunasa. And then with Egyptians, the annual death of Osiris, the corn god, at this time the word corn described any cereal crop. The king of the underworld represented the cycle of death and rebirth in, Egyptian, in ancient Egypt. As the grain stole, stood golden and tall, Osiris, was murdered by his brother Set, the god of chaos and blight, later to be resurrected by his wife Isis to conceive the sun god Horus. Osiris' cycle of death and rebirth was captured in corn mummies, molds of seeded dirt that upon ceremonious watering sprouted grain. And then one more bit about the, the traditions and the folklore around Lunasa. And then I am gonna share one, um, Kind of one ritual that you guys can do before we wrap up. So ancient traditions and modern spells. Reaping the harvest. The summer hay has come to close and the grain that has been planted and that was planted in spring is finally ready to harvest. Upon the return of the farmers from the battlefields, agricultural tools such as plows and sickles were blessed and the difficult work of cutting the grain began. The first cut of corn was made and the spirit of the grain sacrificed. On Bilberry Sunday, the last Sunday in July, young people took to the mountainsides to pick bilberries, the wild European fruits that resemble North American blueberries, also known as warts. The berries grew amid the underbrush where the, pick, where the picking was not easy. This hot day of hard work was thought to inspire love between the young pickers, which would ideally result in marriage. When the maidens returned from the mountainsides, they would bake a bilberry cake and gift it to their future husbands at the Bilberry Sunday dan dance. On Lunasa, a great feast was had to celebrate the abundance from the first harvest. The farmers had planted the seeds, nurtured them, and were now reaping what they had sown. But with this bounty came the opportunity to take stock of all that they had harvested and ensure that it would be enough to sustain them through winter. If they found the harvest to be lacking, they might have considered what else could be planted in time for the final harvest come Samhain. Skill building and creativity. In modern paganism, Lu is known as the Celtic craftsman god, a nod to his impressive variety of talents. In folklore, a young Lu seeks entrance into the, king, the high king's hall at the hill of Tara. There he convinces the gatekeeper that he has no rival in his many skills and he is granted admittance. Shortly thereafter, he leads the Tuatha to battle against the Formorians and earns the title of Samildanak, meaning many joined skills, there before ultimately becoming the high king of Tara himself. Death and transformation. The first grain harvest results in the death of the corn spirit that has been sheltered in the growing fields of wheat. At first cut, the spirit, who may be personified as John Barleycorn, Beowa, Lu, Sif, Osiris, or simply the god, becomes tetherless. But the spirit's death is not in vain. From the fields, he is milled into flour, kneaded into dough, and finally baked into bread, which will fill our bellies and sustain us through the long winter. This transformation not only gives life to the human race, but allows the spirit to be reborn come spring. The cycle of death and rebirth is the most important concept in the universe, and the grain harvest exemplifies it. Lou is credited with being a skilled blacksmith, carpenter, healer, artist, bard, warrior, and ruler of summer storms. That last is a result of his high, of his great battle with Baylor, in which his magical spear struck lightning through the sky. Lu's struggles and triumphs are an embodiment of the battle between light and dark. To triumph over the darkest hour, we must bolster our skills to create enough light to sustain us. 
Creative endeavors not only build our character, but enlighten our spirit and keep our days filled with growing energy. Okay, so there are, like I said, there are a couple of um, rituals and practices. The first one is cottage, the cottage witch's pantry, which is essentially cleaning up your, your pantry if you don't identify as a witch or, you know, it, it, it's irrelevant. Right now is a great time to take stock of what you have, and that's what this ritual practice is all about. So maybe do your spice cabinet or your pantry. Just take stock of the things that you have and also take time to organize what you do have. Right now, you can literally get those clear organizational bins anywhere, even at the Dollar Tree, courtesy of the home edit, because it, it's just blown up. So it's the perfect time to just, you know, create some organization. This, like I said, the autumn is a, the internal autumn and autumn and also the harvest season, it's all associated with the luteal phase. And the luteal phase is a perfect time for organization because our discernment is clear, our analytical skills are really, really clear. So it's, it's the optimal time, the opportune time to really organize, clear things out um, because in terms of our mindset, that's where we are, but also in preparation for the rest that comes during menstruation. So that's one of the first ritual practices that you can do. It's just do a house cleaning, see what's there. And traditionally speaking, this would have been an opportunity to assess your witch's pantry or your apothecary to see what kind of medicinal plants you had, what kind of medicinal plants you needed to gain before you moved into the winter when you would really need those. Um, the next is uh, first harvest market. So this is a great time to do um, markets and um, festivals and, and you know farmers markets and, and things like that. I'm actually hosting one here in town if you're local. Um, come join me at Greenleaf Boutique out on York Highway on August 20th. We're going to be hosting our summer market, and then we also have an autumn market planned for October. Um, but a time to come together and share your skills and, you know, trade and barter and, and just be in community with other people. So it's a great time to do that. If you can't do that on a larger scale, then how can you maybe create something like that on a smaller scale? Maybe you and some girlfriends get together and you know you like you do everyone's nails and your friend does everyone's hair or whatever. You just kind of bring together whatever you know natural gifts and abilities you have and, and just spend time together sharing in, in the gifts that you can bring into the circle. Similar to kind of what we'll be doing at the full moon circle also. Um, they also have grain mother dolly if you want to make a corn dolly. That's a really fun, simple way to honor the season. Um, there's a recipe for bilberry glycerite, um, which is a medicinal tincture essentially um, that you're creating from bilberries. You can also use blueberries or cranberries if bilberries aren't local to where you are. Um, there's an incense recipe, field of gold incense that includes calendula, sunflower, dried hip, dried rose hips, and sandalwood. And if you want any of these, but you don't want to go and buy this book, then just shoot me a message. You can DM me on Instagram and I'll send you a picture of the, of the page. That's totally cool. Um, but what I do want to share with you and what we'll wrap up with is a crystal meditation for transformation. So I'm going to read this out loud. And while I'm reading it, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. Just close your eyes and kind of sit with this. If you have a labradorite crystal, that's the crystal that it recommends holding because it's a crystal of transformation. Um, so if you want to run and grab that really quickly, and I'm going to read and walk you through this meditation. Okay. So transform what no longer serves you into potential energy. At Lunasa, it is important to take stock of all that we have reaped thus far. This is a threshold a cross-quarter day that will lead us into the season of death. Are there any non-productive areas of your life that need to be extinguished before the dark days of introspection and rumination set in? What fields can we clear so that something else can grow? Fire is a tool not only of purification, but of powerful transformation. Some farming practices, particularly in non-industrial societies, use a technique known as slash and burn to fertilize new fields for crops. This involves cutting down trees and other woody plants and burning them where they fall. The farmers then plow the nutrient-rich ash into the field as fertilizer for the soil, which they will sow come planting season. We can use the same technique to prepare our own fields, that is, those mental and spiritual areas where we plant intentions and nurture them into fruition. Labradorite, the crystal of alchemy, is a powerful ally for transformation. It helps us to seek that which resides deep within our psyche and bring the shadows into the light. So go ahead, if you're joining me for this meditation, go ahead and close down the eyes. 
Find yourself in a nice, easy seated position, or if you prefer to lie down for this meditation, that's totally fine too. Just get yourself into a position where you can be alert, but also rested and relaxed and at ease. Let's take a few rounds of breath together, inhaling in through the nose. And exhale through the mouth. Do that again, inhale into the nose. And exhale. One more time, deep inhale into the nose. And exhale. Let it go. Allow your breath to return back to its natural rhythm. Allow yourself to settle in either your, your seat or if you're lying down, just allowing yourself to really settle into this space. Releasing any thoughts that may scurry through the mind, acknowledging them, seeing them, but then gently letting them go. Clearing space for the meditation that we're about to begin. As you sit quietly in your space, I want you to hold your Labradorite crystal, if you have one, I want you to hold it in your left hand. This is the hand of otherworldly communication and shadow discovery. Notice how the crystal feels in your palm. Is it smooth? Is it rounded? Does it come to a point? Is it cool? And as you feel the weight of the crystal in your hand, and yourself seated or lying down in your space, I want you to begin to visualize that you are a tiny little light, a little orb, and you bob around your own head, focusing on your third eye, the space between your eyebrows. And as you gently bounce and twirl around, you get closer and closer to this spot until your light melds with it, forming a portal into your psyche. Now you are you in your own form and you hold a Labradorite lantern in your left hand. And with it, you must weed through heavily forested woodland to seek out your own shadows. Perhaps they're hiding in the hollow of a gnarled tree or under a dead log that's been ravaged by nocturnal creatures seeking refuge. You make your way through this forest and in each dark space that you explore you hold up your lantern and illuminate one of your own shadows they might be personifications of your darkest thoughts your most toxic traits or habits or even emotional fears self-deprecation toxic dependency uncontrolled impulsivity these are all shadows that you can transform. With your Labradorite lantern, you set fire to the spot where they dwell. And you watch as the forest around them reduces to ash. When a cleared plot reveals itself, I want you to move the Labradorite to your right hand and plant a seed in the plot. And visualize that from these ashes, something beneficial grows. Perhaps self-deprecation can be transformed into self-appreciation. Toxic dependency becomes balanced independence. 
and uncontrolled impulsivity alchemizes into harmless spontaneity. Make your way through this forest, using your labradorite to light the way. Burn away that which does not serve you, creating space for the new and then planting your new intentions. Feel free to pause the video here and take as much time as you need, making your way through your forest and clearing the path for your new intentions. We're gonna go ahead and close out here. So to close out our meditation, I want you to visualize that your crops, the seeds of intention that you have so diligently gone through and planted, I want you to visualize that they're sprouting wildly as fresh rain and sunshine nurture them. See all of these new intentions growing into full fruition right before your eyes. Let's take a deep breath in together. Exhale. When you're ready, you can blink your eyes open. And it says here to wear the Labradorite against your skin until your new intentions have blossomed. So maybe you turn it into a necklace or a bracelet, or you just keep it close by. You can keep it in your bra or something like that. Just keep it on your person until there's evidence that your intentions have come to life. That's what I have for you today, my loves. Um, a, a little episode all about Lunasa. There's so much more to learn about this and all the other Sabbaths. But for our sake of time, I just wanted to keep it short and sweet. And uh, I really hope this was informative. If this is something that you're interested in, definitely follow me over on Instagram if you're not already. Because I'm going to be celebrating each of the Sabbaths openly with you guys on there. I'm also, like I said, going to do little videos for each of them. And then feel free to go and do your own research. I pulled from this book. It's so good. Um, I love it. It's, it's got beautiful um, images in it. It's, it's really simple and easy to understand, easy to read. Um, it's a great resource to have, especially if you want to begin to, to celebrate and honor the Wheel of the Year like I am. So thank you guys so much for being here. Lunasa blessings. Again, this is coming out on Wednesday after Lunasa, but feel free to take everything that I've shared, go and find your own things, and still celebrate this week. I am going to be baking bread and a fresh apple pie later on. And um, we're also going to have a little feast, my family and I. So I'm um, really excited to just uh, kind of move into this new season and honor the changes in ourselves and in the world around us. So I love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope you have the best Lunasa ever. Bye.